Good afternoon, saints. Welcome to Grace Baptist Church. Um, we're in the second chapter of Hebrews. And I, I want sort of our theme to be, you hear a lot about people saying, I want to see Christ in you. And I, I guess that's okay. That may be important, but I think it's much more important to see Christ more in His Word. Old Testament and New Testament. Because He said, you search the Scriptures, and He was talking the Old Testament Scriptures. He said, in them you think you have salvation, but they speak of Me. And so, if you want to see more of Christ, read more of His Word. And um, we'll begin with verse 11 in a minute. But what I want to do is a little recap here from where we are, from where we started. We started in the first three verses where he talks about in former times, God spoke to us through the prophets. But in these last days, He has spoken to us in Christ. And so in the Old Testament, in the New Testament, which has priority? And which one you think has priority is what your interpretation is going to be. Are we going to say that the prophets are superior to Christ? Or is Christ superior to the prophets? So, who has priority? The New Testament. In the New Testament... We have the person and work of Christ and His teaching. Is that superior to the Ten Commandments? Yes. In Isaiah 45, He says, Look to Me, all the ends of the earth, and be saved, for I am God and there is no other. And then in John 14, Philip said, Show us the Father. And Jesus said, Philip, have you been with Me all these years and you don't know who I am. It was a superior revelation of who the Father was in the New Testament. And yet they're, they're both true. And he says, you will find the Father by looking at me. So, then in the Old Covenant, we have Sola Scriptura. In the New Testament, sola scriptura, you have some people saying, well, this is just one covenant of grace with different administrations. But the writer of Hebrews says the old covenant is gone. We're in the new covenant because we have the superior revelation of Christ. Another group says we have two peoples of God, but the Bible says none of that says in the 11th verse of the second chapter of Ephesians, He has made one new man out of Gentiles and Jews coming together in Christ. So we have a discontinuity there. In the Old Covenant, people could be covenant breakers. And I want you to listen carefully. If you're in Christ, you cannot break covenant. Because who is the promise to? Abraham and to his seed. Not seeds as of many, but as of one who is Christ. So the covenant is between the Father and Christ, right? Mm -hmm. Can Christ break covenant? And if you're in Him, you cannot break covenant. Does that mean that God cannot discipline you? He can do it very well, can He not? In the Old Covenant, it was external. In the New Covenant, it's in our minds and our hearts. In the Old Covenant, not everybody knew God. There was an idol on every corner in some regimes. But in the New Covenant, we all know God. And we do not have to be taught because He is in us. And in the Old Covenant, not all had forgiveness of sins. But in the New Covenant, we all have forgiveness of sins and there's no memory of them. How many of you remember your sins? 
Would you stop it? <laughs> stop remembering your sins. I think that's almost next to impossible, doesn't it? But I think one day, this wiping away all tears, people say, well, that's because I, I didn't have a loved one that I thought was going to show up. No, I think it's because of our sin. And we're going to look and see the glory of Christ. And we're going to say, why didn't I do better? And He's going to wipe those tears away. Rejoice. In the Old Covenant, we're told to love God and love your neighbors. As in Deuteronomy 6.5, Leviticus 19.18. I'm not going to read those. Um, but what He tells us in John 15 is more important. John 15 13, he reverses the order, but this is my commandment that ye love one another as I have loved you. See how that's better than love the Lord your God and love your neighbor as yourself? It's love as I have loved you. Greater love has no man than this that a man lay down his life for his friends. And Jesus said, I don't call you slaves anymore. I call you friends because you know what I'm going to do. So the logical priority of the New Testament is greater than the Old Testament. The logical priority is the Lord Jesus is over His predecessors. The logical priority of theology of the text over our own theologies and those of others. How could... J. Mac possibly be wrong, right? <laughs> How could John um, Piper be wrong? How could John Calvin be wrong? How could I be wrong? We could all be wrong. The Bible speaks. We should let the Bible speak to us and not we speak to the Bible. So let's go to the text Amen. in the 11th verse of the second chapter of Hebrews. saying, I will declare thy name unto my brethren in the midst of the church will I sing praise unto thee. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold I in the children whom God hath given me. This is Jesus speaking to the Father for us. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. For verily he took not on himself the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. Wherefore, in all things it behooved him to be made like his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest, in things pertaining to God to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself has suffered being tempted, he is able to help them that are tempted. Our Abba Father, we thank you for this final revelation. We're not looking for a new revelation from you. We have it. Open our minds and our hearts to this truth that we have to look no further than Jesus. Our Father, may we have receptive hearts to your teaching today. May we love one another as you have said, as you have loved us. May we hear the soft sound of sandals feet this afternoon. May we see Jesus in Him only. And we pray these things in His mighty name. Amen. Amen. We have in this passage some Old Testament citations. Uh, Psalm 22, 22, 2 Samuel 22, 3, Isaiah 8, 17, and 18. And uh, in Psalm 22, 22, I will declare thy name unto my brethren. Who's the brethren? Now, the writer of Hebrews applies this to Christ. Who is the brethren of Christ? Us. We are. He is our elder brother. And he's saying, I will declare my brethren 
to the Father is what he's saying. He has taken up for us. You ever watch uh, Leave It to Beaver? You ever see Wally take up for Beaver? Well, you think Jesus doesn't do that for his brothers sometimes? Sometimes we're worse than Beaver, aren't we? Not always. Sometimes we are better than the, the Beaver. And sometimes we are worse than the Beaver. Then he says uh, in um, Isaiah 8, I will wait upon the Lord who hides his face from the house of Jacob and I will look for him. Behold, I and the children whom the Lord has given me are for signs and for wonders in Israel from the Lord of hosts who dwelleth in Mount Zion. Remember I told you that not everybody in the Old Covenant was a child of God? Mm -hmm. They were circumcised. They had the sign. But in the New Covenant, we are all. But He's saying, I'm taking up for the children whom the Lord has given me. Sixth chapter of John. Jesus says, All that the Father gives me, you are a love gift from the Father to the Son. And that is why He went to the cross. It was for you and for me and for all who were given to the Son by the Father. He is a suitable Savior because He takes our nature. He suffers for us, as it says in the 8th chapter of Romans. He lived His life totally dependent on the Father. Now we're told to do that, aren't we? And we need to do that, right? Yeah. Now Jesus, if He needed to live His life as a human being totally dependent on the Father, how much more should we? And remember what Jesus said? When you talk to the Father, say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be Thy name. Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. We get up and just go about our business knowing that checks come in through that direct deposit, don't we? Of course, it wasn't always like that in our lifetime and sometimes you can get messed up now. But He says, He that sanctifies and they that are sanctified are all of one. In other words, who sanctified us? Christ. And we're one with Him. Right? Yeah. That means, in this sense, consecrated. That means we're set apart for the Father's work. We have sanctified work to do. What is that? Laying our lives down as a living sacrifice for the Father and for one another. <laughs> Is that better than a to-do list? It is. It's like being married, isn't it? Married to a good, a good husband, right? I mean, we, we can't relate like Teresa can, right? I have the best. No. He sets us apart, sanctifies us to God. All of us have a human nature, and ours is a fallen human nature and yet he came and gave himself to cleanse that human nature to give us a new nature and this is important he is not ashamed now remember I asked you if you were ashamed of things you had done are you? don't be anymore he's not ashamed the, you have no past if you're a saint you have no past the devil has no future but he has one it's not one he likes. In Psalm 22, 22, I will declare thy name unto my brothers. I will put my trust in him, he says in Isaiah. Total dependence. He emphasizes God's sovereignty in giving the Son a people. His redeemed brothers. You've been bought with a price. You're not your own anymore. You have been bought. And then we see in verses 14 and 15, for as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also likewise took part of the same. He became like us in every way. He became human. 
He wasn't half human, half divine. He was fully divine, fully human. And in his humanity, he was like us, without the sin nature. God is sovereign over even Satan and his power. The unrepentant sinners belong to the realm of Satan. That's why our job is to go to these unrepentant people and tell them about Jesus, who will love them unconditionally if they come to Him, confess their sins, repent of them, and trust Him. Because one time, we were in their camp, right? I've heard people say, no, there's this eternal thing from God where we were not under His wrath. Really? Well, Ephesians says, and you, this is the second chapter, verse 1, He hath made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins. We were dead in trespasses and sins. In which in times past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now works in the sons of disobedience. We were one of them. And God called us, among whom also we had all our manner of life in times past in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath. Were we under the wrath of God? Yeah, it says so right there. It says, But God, who is rich in mercy, for His great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in sins, made us alive together with Christ. By grace are you saved. Amen. By grace we were saved. Not because we were any better than anybody else, because we were one of them. And then Colossians 1, 13, Who has delivered us from the power of darkness? We're, we were in the power of darkness? Yes! And has translated us into the kingdom of His dear Son. From darkness to light, in whom we have redemption through His blood. He paid a price. He paid His life for us. Even the forgiveness of sins. And their sins, we will see later in the book of Hebrews, I will remember no more. He doesn't remember your sins. It's just as if you had never sinned and always done right. That's how He sees you. Christ entered the strong man's house, He tells us in Matthew 12. And He's been plundering it for 2,000 years almost. He was in this way, that, that way is the cross, able to deliver His people from lifelong bondage. When you were under wrath, you were in bondage to Satan. But when He came in, He delivered you from the bondage, from the penalty of sin and the power of sin. Some people say, why well, don't I have power over sin? It's because you've been taught to give a to-do list. And instead of counting yourself dead, as in the 6th chapter of Romans says, you died to sin when you were united to Christ. And instead of telling people that, they say, here, go do this. Go do good. And we are supposed to do good. But the way we do it is by being united to Christ, not by doing it on our own. And because Jesus came as a true human, born of a woman, under the law. We see that in Galatians 4.4. 4. But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth His Son made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them, to buy them back. Who's He buying them back from? The devil? No! He's buying them from God the Father who was under His wrath to redeem them that were under the law that we might receive the adoption of sons. We're in a new family now. We're no longer in the realm of Satan or the family of Adam. We are in Christ in the realm of God. And because your sons, God sent forth the Holy Spirit of His Son into your hearts crying, Abba, Father, Daddy, Father. If you had a good father, bless you. If you had a bad father, you're blessed now. And, you have a, and you're even blessed with a better father than you had. And a much better father if you didn't have a good one. 
Verse 16, we see it's not angels He helps, but He took on the seed of Abraham. Christ did not die for angels. That's why Satan has no hope. This is the first mention in the book of Jesus' priestly ministry. A prominent theme that we'll see later is the priesthood. His priestly ministry has reference secondary to sinners. He's our advocate. He offered Himself on our behalf. But primarily, He appeased the wrath of God. And when we see that, we can be faithful. He's merciful and compassionate to us. He's faithful to completely, to the uttermost, fulfill the Father's will. That's in verse 16. He's compassionate only because He's our substitute. His redeeming work is in the service of God. God sent Him. Before time began, He planned it. And He planned to save you. Because of this, the heirs of the new covenant have a greater responsibility than those under the law. You know, some people think that you can believe in Christ and you have it easier than those people. They had to obey the law and you can do what you want to. And that is true if you define the terms right. You say, what do you mean? It's because when Christ comes in, He changes our desires. And if you have those godly desires, you will do much better than anybody under the law. But some people make a confession of faith, but they were never changed. Or some, maybe they were changed slightly and God has to work a lot closer with those. Those who neglect so great a salvation. Under the law of Moses, with two or three witnesses, you could be stoned to death. Under the new covenant, you can face eternity in hell if you neglect this salvation. Rejoice! We are bound for glory. We are already have received, remember the 17th chapter of John, that we have the glory of Christ. Is that hard for you to comprehend? It blows my mind. Every day I think about it, that God would do something like that for somebody like me. We, we change some of the words in these old psalm, songs that we sing. A sinner such as I, and what was it Isaac Watts wrote? A worm such as I. That's what we are on the scale. Our representative is already crowned with glory, and we're in Him, so we have His glory. John 5, 23 and 24 says, We must honor the Son like we honor the Father. How do we honor the Father? He's God. So we honor the Son as God. God is mindful of us, it says He took on human nature. He took Abraham's seed. Why? Because He is the seed of Abraham. And the promises were made to Abraham and his seed. It wasn't to the nation of Israel as such. It was to Christ. And Paul tells us that in the third chapter, the 16th verse, of Galatians. On the stage of the Old Covenant was redemptive history all through the Scriptures. And that's what we're living in because He has fulfilled that redemptive history by raising Jesus from the dead. He took hold of the seed of Abraham because He is the seed of Abraham. To be the perfect Savior it was necessary for Jesus to be like us like the ones He saved. He can represent us. Only as true human could He be merciful and a faithful high priest. God is mindful of us. It says in 2.6, What is man that you are mindful of him? Or the son of man that you visit him? Unaided by human works, God planned this from the beginning. He didn't ask our input because we, we didn't have an input. We didn't even know we needed to be saved. He alone devised a plan and He assures sinners and then He confirms it with an oath. We see this in Hebrews 6.17. I don't want to do the same thing with this one I did in the last one. 
wherein God willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of promise the immutability of His counsel confirmed it by an oath. And because He didn't have anybody higher than Himself to swear by, He swore by Himself. The highest. God swore that you are in Christ if you come to Him. If all this be true, then how shall we escape so great a salvation if we neglect it? If you're listening to me today and you don't know Christ, as Spurgeon said, look to Christ all the ends of the earth and be saved. Behold Him. Behold His beauty. Behold His glory. Behold the work He has done for sinners and run to Him now. Today. If not today, when? May you go in grace and peace of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.